All right, welcome back to Retcon. I hope you're having an awesome time so far. Our next session will be led by Jeff Koch. He is the Chief Innovation Officer and Chief Information Officer at Mill Creek Residential. Please join me in welcoming Jeff to our virtual stage. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me today. I'm very excited to, to share with y'all uh, a little bit into the world of connectivity, cybersecurity, and innovation. Uh, all those topics are near and dear to my heart as we just go through uh, a world that's ever changing in front of us right now with COVID and everything that's happening there. We're seeing changes in the market, changes in technology, the need for uh, good technologists to come in and really build out strategies that tie to revenue, cost savings, uh, and productivity gains. And so really excited to go through that today. A little bit of background on myself. Uh, I've been in the real estate world for about five years. Before that, I came from global chemical manufacturing, so a very different world altogether, but rose up through the technology ranks there and was actually a global chief information security officer for a Fortune 500 company, where I literally fought nation states every day. So cybersecurity to me is dear to my heart. So as I came into the real estate world and started uh, really driving technology, I made sure cybersecurity was a core fundamental belief in everything that we do from a data privacy, data risk, and uh, governance standpoint. And so uh, now in my position at, uh, at Mill Creek running innovation and technology, I actually have four different groups. My first group is traditional IT, so backend uh, functions, business functions, as well as um, helping the uh, business grow revenue cycles through that. Then outside of that, I have a community technology group. So this is a group that focuses exclusively on the design, the implementation, and the management of all of our technology in our buildings from low voltage to 5G to Wi-Fi to smart home to IoT networks, Internet of Things, all those stuff falls into that community technology group. Then I have uh, ESG, which ESG focuses on environmental, social and governance. Uh, and so it's your resident wellness campaigns, it's your sustainability, your green buildings, your energy management, uh, the funneling of climate and physical risk. So all those things tie into ESG. Uh, and then my, my final group is innovation and innovation is more of a think tank, thinking about the future of how technology uh, influences our decisions, where we build, how we build, how our residents experiencers are impacted, not only today, but 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, and how do we use technology as a competitive advantage. So that's the lens that I'm talking to you all through today. Uh, Mill Creek is a multifamily developer with about 20,000 units under management and another 13,000 units in the pipeline. Um, so we have a national presence all up the, down the West Coast, all up and down the East Coast, and then scattered through Denver, down into Texas, Nashville, Phoenix, and a few other locations as well in the, the central part of the U.S. So very excited. Um, so let's just dive into it. You know, as, as I go through this and I think about it, I wanted to talk to you all about strategies as we think about how we make product selection how we then tie that product selection into our uh, compute of cybersecurity and the risk components. And then, you know, what are contract hotspots? What do we need to be thinking about service performance? So let's start at uh, connectivity. You know, connectivity is incredibly important. And what I really consider a, a digital foundation. So we spend all this money, millions of dollars, building buildings on the foundation and the way the building is architected but we need to be thinking about our digital foundation too. So how does the building connect? How do we keep residents connected to the lives through their internet connections? Whether that be cellular, whether that be a physical connection, whether that be Wi-Fi, private LTE, um, there's a bunch of different ways to distribute this. And it's really important that we get this right early on because this allows us to pivot and augment down the road, not only now, as the building is built, but 10, 15 years down the road when we need to retrofit the building. And so it's very important that we put in the proper pathways, that we put in the proper conduit, smurf tube, whatever it may be, so that we're able to augment that design as the needs of our residents grow. And so the first thing I, I like people to think about is the two fundamentals for why are we doing what we're doing? One, we're doing what we're doing for financial return, some sort of uh, return on of our, our investment. The second though is our resident experience. So the people that are living through the building that have to live with this technology day in and day out, what is it doing to improve their life? How do we provide great experiences? So when you think about connectivity, you think about, well, what is the resident experience? When they walk up to a building as a prospect before they even become a resident, 
What's that experience to them? How easy is it in to get into the building? What's the access control look like? Is it a, a touch screen where they can call the front office really easily and someone pops up on the screen and says, hey, welcome to our building. Please come on in, meet me in the lobby and I'll take you from there. And they get buzzed in. Or is it just an old dial pad that you hit a number on it and the door buzzes and you get in, right? So what are you doing from that prospect perspective? Is it simple for them to enter the building? Then you start thinking about residents and their access to the building. Well, they have parking garages, they have multiple building entrances, they have common areas where the amenities are that they need access to those amenities. And so getting your access control right where it's one system that ties it all together to one credential, whether that be a fob or a mobile credential on your phone that ties it all together to then move forward into the unit. You know, uh, there's very few vendors that have a full building solution that does all of that. The unit lock down to the common area to others. So a lot of what you see happening in the market today is integrations where they're tying multiple sources together. You have a couple different providers now that are starting whole building solutions, but they're relatively green in that development. And so understanding where their gaps are, how they're doing it, are the locks fire rated? You know, how long are they fire rated? Um, have those locks gone through penetration testing? Are they online locks or offline locks? Um, so I have a big thing about online locks and offline locks coming from a cybersecurity world. Anything that's connected to the internet has a risk and vulnerability. I don't care if you think it's the most hardened device in the world. If it has internet connectivity, there is a risk associated with it. So as an owner operator, we have to ask ourselves, what risk are we willing to accept? And then if we're willing to accept it, how do we mitigate any of the additional risks? And then do we transfer any of the risk? So what I mean by that is if a lock is online for the unit itself, you're now talking about physical access into someone's home. Uh, versus an offline lock for the unit lock, um, where I can see an online lock possibly for a common area or a package locker room or something like that. But if you have an online lock in the unit, you've exposed that person's home to possible penetration uh, in from uh, an intruder. And that's a concern, right? So evaluate the risk appropriately and make sure you have the right liabilities in your contracts if that risk is present. Um, and so this is where you get into some of the contract nuances. Uh, from that side, you know, you start thinking about that holistic solution and, and making it simple for the user to get into that building, right? Well, yeah, as you build out this access control network, you need to understand how does that access control network connect back into the connectivity of the building? If it's an online lock, you need to have them connected. Is that over Wi-Fi? Um, is that over, you know, a Z-Wave or Zigbee network or, or some other LoRaWAN type, uh, you know, connectivity? And so, or private LTE, whatever it may be. So when you look at the building, I think the first fundamental belief that I like to push towards people is that we need to move to this idea that buildings are a whole experience. And so when I walk in, I want Wi-Fi from the second I get into the building to into the elevator, up the elevator, down the corridor, into my unit. I wanna be able to take a Wi-Fi call on that. You know, If I have bad signal in the building, I wanna be able to jump on the Wi-Fi to be able to do that, right? Um, if I'm in my unit and I wanna go down to the gym, I want to be able to seamlessly walk out of my unit, stay on a call or be checking email or whatever it is as I go down, listening to music, streaming down to the gym, right, to work out. And so that seamless experience of connectivity is really important. And there's a new trend in the space really around bulk internet that's starting to provide that. But there's some things around bulk that you still have to figure out is how do I, as a uh, resident have the option to have my own subnet, it's called, it's my own private network as I walk around. It's Jeff's network and Jeff's network follows me around the building, right? Do, it, is it like that? Or does the provider provide some sort of, you know, different name of the network that you have to connect to? And so ask these questions. Um, so bulk internet's growing because it allows that seamless connectivity. You have a, a more traditional model, which is called a retail model. And it's basically I, as a resident, go in and I subscribe to Verizon or AT&T or Comcast or whoever it may be, depending on my region. And I get internet directly into my home, but that's the only place I have it. And then I may get common area net network connectivity from my uh, you know, owner operator that's managing the property. But that's, that's it. I don't have it in the corridors. I don't have it in the elevators. I don't have it in the parking garage. All places where my cellular signal may be spotty. Because any building that's built with rebar and concrete, you're going to start to see some issues there. Wood frame, you may be, have less issues, issues on cellular. So I think that's important. But there's a new trend coming out called bulk opt-in. 
And meaning that you can still have the residential model in place, but you can also have a bulk provider that blankets the community and people can opt into that. And you might see a higher penetration rate into the entire building going that route because to them, they're getting a much faster experience, more reliable experience. They're able to go from one place to the next on it. So it's really beneficial. Um, and so that connectivity is important of deciding what you want to do. And the second piece of connectivity that's important there is understanding how that ties into the future of 5G. So is your building set up to augment itself when 5G is properly released for in-building distribution? So today, most 5G providers are all external, right? They're building tall uh, 5G towers and 5G is a type of signal because it's very point-to-point uh, -point and it has to have direct line of sight. Um, if there's a building or glass or a wall in between, it's not going to work very well. Um, so 5G distribution in buildings is going to be very different. There's models like citizen broadband radio uh, service that uh, could be distributed through a, a wireless type technology within the building. Uh, and there's some opportunities there. Uh, so talking with the providers about what they're doing to augment their networks for 5G is important because as an owner operator, one of the things you're going to want to think about is I'm installing this network. Am I going to have to totally rip it out and replace it when 5G comes out in 10 years or, you know, when it's finally mainstream? Or am I going to be able to augment the network I've already done, minimize my investment cost down the road? So that's one of the things we really want to focus on is how do we minimize that investment cost so that you get the better ROI? It goes back to principle number one is, is some sort of financial return. Um, the other is the, the types of connectivity that you want for your IoT network, your Internet of Things network. This is all the little sensors you have throughout the building. It could be a sensor as simple as putting it on the treadmills to know which treadmills are in use and which aren't. So you can report that back to your residents. So if they want to go down to the gym, they could quickly ask their voice activated device, how many treadmills are open? And it would say uh, three of the five, right? And so they know, oh, it can go down now, right? Or whatever it may be. Uh, but those sensors connect to something. Is it Wi-Fi? Is it Z-Wave, ZigBee, Private LTE, CBRS? All these different types of connectivity out acronyms out there. But ask the questions of how does the IoT network converge with the building network, right? And this idea of a building network is really important. If you do a retail model internet connectivity network, one of the things that I still suggest to owner operators is building some sort of a property management overlay uh, owner network in place. And that way you could still do uh, Wi-Fi calling for your residents in corridors, elevators, common areas, but you would have the option to move forward uh, with uh, managing your asset correctly. Your, your leasing agents could tour around and still have Wi-Fi connectivity throughout the building, et cetera. So connectivity is a digital foundation that's incredibly important. A lot of areas in there to focus on, you know, warranty, performance. So if you go to bulk internet, you know, you have one provider in the building. Performance is absolutely ne a necessity for your residents, right? People care about speed and reliability when it comes to internet. Uh, I don't necessarily care who my internet comes from if I have fast feeds and it's reliable, right? And so uh, having some sort of service level agreements, SLAs, that you can get out of the agreement should they start having chronic failures. So a chronic failure termination, right? Um, you could exit the agreement from that. Um, and then make sure you understand all the revenue vehicles, the cost savings that you have, because some of these connectivity options you can invest in up front, and that then allows you uh, the opportunity to have a bigger margin to invest back into the product so that your residents get the best wholesale buying power uh, for that uh, versus, you know, you have the provider pay for it all up front and there's a different margin value in there for you as, as a reinvestment capital. So something to look into. And the next is installation. Who's going to install it? Uh, and how's that going to be done? Is it a retrofit where they need to go and they need to rip up drywall? Um, how are you going to project manage that? And so starting to think through who the partners are out there that can help you oversee this is really important. There's a lot of partners that are growing in this space um, that have really good project management oversight. So that they can come in and say, hey, you know, we can help you get the right contract that has the best opportunity for your residents, also has the best return for you as an owner operator. And then on that front, we'll actually manage the process because a typical installation is going to require at least, you know, six to eight, maybe more site visits to make sure the installation is happening correctly. Um, so 
it's really important to have that, that project management oversight on connectivity. Then let's move down into uh, to cybersecurity. As we start thinking about connectivity, we start thinking about, wow, I have all these things connected to the internet. Everything's happening now. How am I actually setting up this digital foundation? Is it, is it network segmented? So what I mean by that is, do you have multiple different networks that allow one for the residents traffic to go over, for your property management traffic to go over, for uh, maybe your cable provider, or cable TV person, or are they all on one converged? And if they are, how are you properly setting up the firewalls in between each of those networks? Um, and so how are you setting up the protections in place? Are you monitoring? Are you able to determine behavioral anomalies in there? Um, and so there's some work to be done around risk quantification of your building and understanding that every building that we develop, every building that we build has a different element of risk to it because the designs slightly differ, or it may be a different provider and they do things a little different than the next. Uh, one provider may have a really strong hosting agreement uh, with SSA 18 SOC 2 certifications, uh, and the next one might not. And so do you want to you know, do business with someone that doesn't have that type of level of security protocols and process in place? And so knowing what is happening from a network fundamental layer uh, requires you to involve people that understand networks. And so that may be a third party review. That may be um, your own IT department or technology department. Um, but having someone that has an understanding of that's really important uh, because you need to also then tie that into your insurance, uh, into your indemnity, making sure you have proper limitation of liabilities in place, making sure you have carve outs for confident, uh, a breach of confidentiality or gross negligence or misconduct, um, all those type of things. You want to make sure you have the proper things in place there and, and understanding how that also ties to service level performance. Then uh, from a cybersecurity standpoint, we need to do more penetration tests. We need to understand what our network is, uh, how it's set up, where the data is that's traversing it. So if, if I'm a user and I'm in my unit and I'm uh, you know, talking to my family on FaceTime, do I feel like I'm protected in the fact that no one's able to hear that conversation or jump in the middle and know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, or if I'm talking to my voice activated device and doing a search, do I feel confident that no one's listening to that conversation, right? So those are questions that residents ask and they want to know. And so you having a proper understanding of how your network's architected helps you be able to define yes or no to that question. And then if it is a yes or no, knowing what vulnerabilities exist on that network happens through penetration tests. So getting a third party to come in and test that IoT network you have in place and really understanding what makes sense um, for them. From there, you know, uh, you want to make sure that you understand what data you even want access to. So one of the big things I, I talk about is I don't want video data. I don't want doorbell data. I don't want voice data that I have access to, right? I wanna segment that off so that the resident has protections around that. And I'm not the one governing any of that data. And the purpose for that is, is I don't need it. And I want the resident to have the right form of privacy tied to that. And so as I move forward, architecting networks is very important to make sure that that's the case. And so data use uh, is important though to owner operators. It'd be really nice to know which doors are used the most frequently in a building. you know. If the door from the parking garage to the second floor, uh, you know, entry area is the most used door, there may be a better use to put some sort of amenity feature there. Maybe it's a concierge service. Maybe it's a, the package room for large packages or a package locker, or maybe it's a, um, the drink cart that they can grab a drink from and it automatically charges their, their resident uh, number or whatever it is, right? So there's different things you can do when you know some of that data. Um, there's other marketing purposes to understanding data as well. So really hone in on what data you think is beneficial. Don't just collect everything because there are liabilities tied to collecting everything. And you may put yourself in hot water and understand also some of the current laws that are in place like the California Consumer Privacy Act and the more recent one that was passed in this last general election um, with the terms of California privacy. Um, so if you're developing there, know the rights that the residents have and what they're allowed to do and not allowed to do um, and what you're allowed to actually take and not take. 
um, meaning use that data for and not use it for. The other thing is cyber insurance. So as we think about cyber insurance, it's really important to think about <clears throat> um, what do we want to mitigate, right? How much insurance do we need? But also what is the sublimits of that insurance policy look like? So if I have a $5 million cyber insurance policy across my company, but I have a sublimit of only 250,000 for a fish um, fraud, meaning that someone fished me over email, they got my username and credentials, they got into the system and they stole all this user data, but my sublimit was only 250,000 for that, I'm now in trouble. I don't get that cap of 5 million. I only get the 250,000 and I'm gonna pay the rest of that out of the pocket. That's a concern. So really understanding your cyber insurance policies is very important um, so that you're, you're well protected as you go into this. Um, so it leads me into innovation. You know, there's a lot of risks, there's a lot of concern, but there's a lot of really cool things happening. And I think that's important for everyone to understand is that there are some technologies that are flash in the pan, not worth doing, uh, but then there are others that have really good returns on them. So I, I break it down into two categories as I think about things high level. You have your revenue type opportunities, you have your cost savings type opportunities, right? So uh, revenue opportunities in innovation spaces, you, know, you all have rooftops. Um, what are you doing with them? Are there potential leases that you could do with those rooftops, 5G, solar? Um, you know, there's opportunities there uh, possibly. So thinking about that as a revenue opportunity. EV charging, so all these electronic vehicles, is there some sort of new, new road to how to enter the EV market? And there's partners and vendors coming up in this space that are doing that. Bulk Wi-Fi, you know, there's a uh, money tied to that. Smart home, but smart home from a very specific use case, you know, thermostat, access control, leak detection, voice activation, all tied into that, you know, uh, lighting, making it beneficial to the, the user of the, the unit, the resident themselves, uh, and going from there. You have digital signage, you know, variable advertising in specific locations, but not too much, package management, indoor air quality, co-working spaces in your common areas, you know, grab and go food dispensers, those type of things, all could be revenue opportunities, depending on how you look at them, how you innovate in those spaces, maybe in how we architect a building today. You know, how does the resident uh, prospect come into the building? Is, is it done differently now that we have COVID type procedures where we need people to, uh, um, you know, enter buildings differently and safely following social distancing criteria? Uh, maybe the leasing offices all need to be on ground floor versus some being up on a club floor. You know, maybe not. You know, maybe they have separate elevators. Who knows? So different things to think about from that. Then you get into the productivity and cost savings of innovation. So you have access control, which I talked about earlier. The seamless access control methodology provides and enables so many different types of services from food delivery, pet walkers, concierge services, dry cleaners, package delivery, all that stuff ties to access control. Self-touring ties to access control. So being able to innovate in self-touring and really focus on the areas where it makes the most sense. You know, How do I get a, a prospect online through a chat bot maybe into a building, guide them through the building on a virtual map, and then be able to close the deal on the back end, tying them directly into an application and connecting them with a, a virtual leasing agent who can talk to them over the phone and close the deal, right? So how do you do that? How do you automate that? Do you have the right infrastructure in place from a technology wise to do geofencing so you know where they're in the gym and a pop-up comes on the phone saying, hey, welcome to our gym. Here's what our gym's all about. Um, going through it from that way. And then you have smart lighting, you know, just being able to reduce the amount of electricity used in the building, the energy footprint, you have smart parking management where people can come in and find where spots are open or aren't open. Um, you have video surveillance now that uses artificial intelligence to determine whether you had an issue or something that you should do an investigation on. Uh, you have smart garden sprinkler systems now that you can manage appropriately so you reduce your water usage. Uh, you have water flow monitoring uh, and water leak detection so you can notify residents as soon as something happens or we're noticing that you're using more water than normal. Here's different ways to reduce your water usage, which reduces their bills. So there's a benefit to them. Uh, and then you have indoor air quality, which is a new thing. Been around for a while, but new from the, the fact that uh, it's definitely taken off with COVID. How do we clean air? How do we recycle air from outside in? To what degrees? So all these things tie into this, you know, innovation of technology, but how do they all integrate appropriately to provide that return? 
you know, make sure you're talking with the right people, make sure everyone's really understanding the conversations so that they uh, get it from a business standpoint, from a financial return standpoint. There's definitely money here uh, in this that, that is tangible, that's understandable. I think uh, generally the market focuses too much on the experience sometimes and not also on the money. I think you have to combine both of them together to make a useful product uh, that really provides a, a return to you as a owner operator, to your investors, to your shareholders, to the residents as, as you know, people living in your communities. I think we can build some really cool uh, communities that really make people's lives simpler and more effective. And so I really appreciate the time today. I appreciate going through all this information with y'all. And as I wrap up here, I just, uh, I thank you for the time. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. You can find me on LinkedIn and we'll go from there. So thank you all very much. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us, Jeff. The audience is giving you a big virtual round of applause. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Awesome. All right. If you're looking for your next session, you can go ahead and check out your agenda to see where you're going next or take some time to connect with your peers with some one-on-one -on -one virtual networking. Thanks so much. And we'll see you around.